podcasting's choice from coast to coast, continent to continent, right here 24 7. PNR Network's Dramatic Audio Presentations presents The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, adapted for the podcasting medium by T.C. Kirkham. In the year 1938, with the United States stuck in the midst of the greatest financial depression ever seen in this country, with the stark threat of yet another major war looming on the near horizon throughout the European continent, and with industrial and technological changes happening so fast that people could hardly keep up with them, people increasingly turned toward radio entertainment as a way to forget their troubles and unwind a bit. Little did the American people know that one day that year that relatively new entertainment medium would seemingly turn on them, blurring the line between fiction and nonfiction, and between fantasy and reality. On October 30th, 1938, that is exactly what happened to the people tuned in to the Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS, that Sunday evening to listen to a radio drama called The Mercury Theater of the Air. Its company, headed up by a young actor, writer, director, and future filmmaker named Orson Welles, and his partner, already well-known writer, director, and stage actor, John Houseman. Aired live to the network's East Coast affiliates at 8 p.m. on Halloween Eve, the show presented an adaptation of the H.G. Wells novel The War of the Worlds, written by Howard E. Cook. What followed for the next hour, and its aftermath, made radio history, and it is still considered one of the greatest radio controversies of all time. With the first half hour of the mostly commercial free program staged as a series of news bulletins in the current day covering the arrival of a strange object from space near the small town of Grover's Mill, New Jersey after a series of explosions on the planet Mars noticed by astronomers earlier that evening, many people, having missed the announcement of the dramatic aspect of what they were hearing, were convinced that they were listening to an actual news broadcast. Although greatly exaggerated in scope at the time of the broadcast, there is no doubt that a small degree of Americans were panicked by the broadcast. Studies today show that the panic was not nearly as large or as widespread as the news media insisted it was at the time. Despite reports, there were no suicides. In fact, not one single death or major injury was ever legitimately attributed to the panic that ensued during and after the broadcast. But it was enough to turn Wells and his cast into household names and is still remembered as one of the most recognizable happenings in entertainment history. And it happened again, exactly 30 years later. Inspired by and in tribute to the 30th anniversary of the original 1938 broadcast, in October 1968, radio station WKBW-AM in Buffalo, New York, aired an adapted version of the radio play, this time substituting their own real-life news department personalities and local locations in the greater Grand Island and Niagara Falls, New York area for those in the Wells version, and once again updating the time frame to the current day. Despite weeks of advanced promotion and broadcasting later in the evening, 11 p.m., the broadcast triggered a moderate panic in the immediate area. So concerned was the adaptation's author, WKBW News Department head Jefferson K., who also played himself in the play, at the flood of calls coming into the station as the recorded presentation progressed that he broke into the recording to announce once again that it was merely a drama presentation. Convinced that he and others at the station were going to lose their jobs in the ensuing controversy, Kay handed in his resignation before leaving that night. Despite the slight panic and the triggering of a Canadian guard unit just across the river, the show was a resounding success and Kay's resignation was not accepted. They would later rework and restage their version three more times between 1969 and 1975 and local Buffalo station 97 Rock revived it and recorded a brand new version in 1998, with several of the surviving original WKBW personalities, including Jefferson K., taking part. 
Two other well-known versions of the H.G. Wells story are also celebrating anniversaries this year. The National Public Radio version, staged for the 50th anniversary of the Orson Welles original and produced using an adapted version of the Howard Koch script from 1938 and starring Jason Robards, various NPR personalities, newsman Douglas Edwards, and entertainer Steve Allen, is celebrating its 30th anniversary, originally aired on October 30, 1988. And record producer Jeff Wayne's musical adaptation of the original H.G. Wells story, Starring Richard Burton, Justin Hayward, David Essex, Chris Thompson, Phil Lynott, Julie Covington, and Jerry Wayne, is celebrating its 40th anniversary, having been released in June 1978. There have been many other versions as well, in countries all around the world. And what you are about to listen to is our version, produced in tribute to those versions that have come before. We're not perfect, and by those standards we are decidedly amateurs. But it's definitely for our love of those past versions that we decided to tackle this ourselves. We have taken our inspiration primarily from the 1938 Wells and 1968 WKBW versions and have also included snippets of other adaptations and tributes to some other versions as well. We've borrowed a few ideas from the various versions and tried to incorporate them into what we've produced. We've also included a brief clip from the 1938 broadcast in tribute, and hopefully, if we've done things correctly, you won't even realize it's there. You will hear the story as you have never quite heard it before. It is once again set in the present day, in our case, 2018, and once again uses the radio waves of the world to convey the story and action. Our version starts off in small-town America, at a tiny community radio station in the Midwest, and slowly expands to a greater scope than has ever been done before. You will also get a few original twists and turns you may not see coming until it's too late. You have been forewarned. Although we use the names of real towns and cities throughout the broadcast, the call letters and radio stations used, as well as their locale, and also as well as most businesses and organizations mentioned, and some other locations used, are mostly fictitious. Song segments are scoped for copyright purposes, and any ads you may hear are wholly fictitious. And now, the PNR Network's podcasting personality team are pleased to present PNR Premier Audio Productions' dramatic adaptation of the H.G. Wells story, The War of the Worlds. We now take you to a tiny community radio station in the small Missouri town of Holt Summit. It is 5.55 p.m. Central Time on October 31st, 2018, as our story begins. Community Radio HLT, that's classic music from Justin Hayward, Forever Autumn from 1978. Community calendar time right now. Don't forget that trick-or-treat for the kitties is tonight from 6 to 8 p.m. Community Radio HLT will have two hours of fun Halloween music for trick-or-treating beginning right after the 6 p.m. news. Lots of great music and Halloween tippets with Jeff Bloom starting at 6.05 this evening. So make sure you've got your radios tuned right here. Parents, don't forget to make sure your kids are safe. Keep an eye out for Halloween revelers crossing the street. And kids, remember to use the crosswalk whenever possible, okay? It's four minutes before 6 p.m. on this Halloween evening. I'll see you tomorrow afternoon. I'm Leanne Fury, Community Radio, HLT. Stay tuned for the 6 p.m. news right after tonight's edition of Stargate. Stargate, October 31st, 2018. The planet Mars has been in the news, having recently been at its closest point to the Earth in 15 years. 
You'll find our red planet neighbor in the eastern sky tonight near the constellation Capricorn, and shining brighter, much brighter in fact, than any other nearby star. Its ice-capped south pole now faces Earth, looking like the white creamy center surrounded by a rust-colored caramel, much like those candies being handed out for trick-or-treat around the country to kids everywhere tonight. Mars's southern hemisphere is presently experiencing their version of summer, although it's not likely to be much of a vacation destination today for any Martians were they to exist. But one might imagine them to have once had quite a summer rivaling Earth's in past millennium with water rushing through the mighty Martian canyons seen by Viking space probes. Today, these canyons are dry and the hottest Martian summer barely registers a rather chilly 60 degrees. NASA probes found no clear signs of life on our red neighbor, but although people know now that Mars has no intelligent life as we know it, some people once believed that, as author H.G. Wells once put it, intellects vast, cool, and unsympathetic regarded this Earth with envious eyes and slowly but surely drew their plans against us. Stargate is produced for Independent News Network by Blue Hill Observatory in association with the Charles Hayden Planetarium at the Museum of Science, Boston, Massachusetts. For Stargate, I'm James Warner. This Saturday and Sunday, it's the biggest open house in Winthrop Heartland's history. Meet the biggest stars in the world of extreme sports. BMX champion Harry Colby, Jerry Colby, Christian Rayburn, and Hall of Famer Cole Knighton. Street skateboarding superstars Holly Langton, Benji Halford, Freedom Malloy, and Malibu Storms. Big Air stars Romeo Reardon, Tracy Jotner, Tori Carr, and Ventura Starnes. Snowboarders Doogie Clifford, Dixon Sherwood, and Tina Cramden, and more, more, more. Don't wait any longer. Get signed up now. Winter sports training starts November 12th. Summer sports training starts November 19th. The only X Games, Burton Tour, and Alley Sports Certified Extreme Sports Training Center in the Midwest. Winthrop Heartland, part of the Winthrop Extreme Sports Training Family. Just off State Route AA at the intersection of Camp Kiam Road. Halt Summit. Be there. WHLT AM FM Community Radio 1510 AM 103.1 FM Holt Summit, Missouri It's 6 p.m. for HLT Newsnight. I'm Mark Wendell. It's going to be a nice evening for trick-or-treating kids this evening here in mid-Missouri with our mild weather continuing through tomorrow. The National Weather Service in St. Louis is reporting that a slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is emerging over Nova Scotia this evening, causing a low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern and mid-Atlantic states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of light gale force to that area. But this disturbance will remain well east of us and shouldn't affect our local weather, where we'll have partly cloudy skies through tomorrow. Low tonight in the upper 40s, the high tomorrow, 66. Jefferson City Police have arrested a man in connection with the theft of nearly $2,000 from a local charity over the past weekend. Police say Chris Foster, 25, was apprehended without incident last night. Foster was identified by family members after his picture, taken from security cameras at the headquarters of the Elves Society during a break-in last Friday night, was circulated in the local media. The Society is a local-based charity specializing in helping needy families celebrate holidays and birthdays. You can now add Missouri to the number of states that are trying to craft their own net neutrality law. State Senator Tina Brown has proposed legislation at the State House this week to replace the national net neutrality protections rolled back by the FCC last January. 
The bill also adds a ban on so-called zero rating in the state and also adds a provision for the state government to require all state-employed contractors to follow net neutrality standards as they are set up. Governor Parson said at a press briefing today that he will need more time to look into the situation, but says he has no problem with supporting the bill once it makes it through the state Senate, possibly as early as December, as long as it follows the original guidelines that were repealed earlier this year. Scientists and astronomers from around the world are keeping an eye to the heavens this evening after Dr. Richard Danielson of the Mount Jennings Observatory in Chicago, Illinois, reported observing multiple explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals, starting earlier this afternoon on the surface of the planet Mars. Analysis with instruments aboard the Hubble Space Telescope and the International Space Station has indicated the gas explosions are comprised of hydrogen and that they are moving towards Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Andrea Pitney of Boston's Blue Hill Observatory confirmed Dr. Danielson's observation, describing the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame being shot into the Martian atmosphere, much like a mortar is launched from a cannon, unquote. Multiple scientists have concluded that the explosions do not form a threat to our planet, but that the space radiation emitted from them may affect various satellite communications, causing periodic temporary television and cell phone signal issues over the next 12 to 24 hours, similar to that which happens during heavy sunspot activity. Police, who caught three teenagers orange-handed with 48 stolen pumpkins and one gourd, are asking residents of a St. Louis suburb to view a pumpkin lineup online to see if their Halloween squash are among those recovered. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch reports pumpkins began vanishing last week in Maryland Heights. After tracking down the culprits in a pumpkin-crammed SUV, officers snapped a picture of the abducted decor and posted it to Facebook. About a dozen pumpkins remained unclaimed Tuesday. Two 18-year-olds are charged with misdemeanor stealing, while a 16-year-old has been referred to juvenile court. For HLT Evening News, I'm Mark Wendell, HLT Community Radio. HLT Community Time is 6.05, and time for Jeff Bloom in HLT's annual Trick or Treat Parade. It's the Jeff Bloom Show on HLT Community Radio. Hey, 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 everyone. It's Jeff Bloom on the most wonderful night of the year. That one night where kids go door to door and get free candy. Free candy is always good, right? It's Trick or Treat tonight, and for the next two hours, we've got the tunes that will help you have a great time on HLT's 8th Annual Trick or Treat Parade. So, let's turn it up loud and listen as you go door to door, kids. Let's kick things off with this classic. Every kid and every kid at heart loves it. It's Bobby Boris Pickett and the Monster Mash. For my monster from his slab began to rise And suddenly, to my <laughs> Monster Mash Ball Monster Mash Ball Monster Mash Ball Monster Mash Ball That's the Monster Mash from Bobby Boris Pickett On this great Halloween night 2018 I'm Jeff Bloom Say, did you know that there are other appropriate days That also happen to fall on Halloween? Well, today happens to be National Caramel Apple Day. I know, when I was a kid, I used to get caramel apples all the time when I went trick-or-treating. It's also National Magic Day for all those mystical spirits out there pretending to be somebody from the Harry Potter universe tonight. And perhaps most perfect of all, it's National Doorbell Day. Lots of doorbells getting used tonight as we continue our trick-or-treat parade on HLT with this Let's Go Stomp Tokyo with Godzilla from Blue Oyster Cult. Hey, kiddies, that's part of Blue Oyster Cult's Godzilla. 
I'm Jeff Bloom on Community Radio HLT. Sorry to cut that off short, kids, but we have a bulletin coming in from Independent Network News. Independent Network News. This is a special report from Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt. NASA has issued what it is terming a blue alert to observatories around the world tonight, asking for all observatories to continue to observe an ongoing group of incandescent gas explosions on the surface of the planet Mars, believed to be made up of hydrogen. These explosions first began occurring at around 1.45 Eastern Time this afternoon and have continued at about 25-minute intervals throughout the day up to the present time. Earth is not in danger from the explosions themselves, but radiation in the explosions is headed directly for Earth at an enormous velocity and is expected to cause momentary outages with telephone, television, and cell phone satellite signals beginning later this evening and lasting for another 12 to 24 hours. This has been a special news report from Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt. Independent Network News. Wow, that's pretty funky, isn't it, kids? Great night for all that crazy stuff on Mars to be happening. Fits in perfectly with the mood of this wonderful Halloween evening. I'm Jeff Bloom. You're listening to HLT Community Radio. And hey, let's pay tribute to what's going on up there on the Red Planet this evening. Here's the Martian Hop on the Trick or Treat Parade. That's the classic novelty hit, The Martian Hop, on the Trick or Treat Parade from Community Radio HLT. I'm Jeff Bloom. With all this stuff going on on Mars tonight, do you ever wonder if there's life out there at all? I mean, let's face it, kitties. There's too much space for humanity to be the only form of life out there. That's just crazy to think that way. I think, well, I like to think that everyone out there is more like Mr. Spock from Star Trek and less like the crazy xenomorphs from Alien. Yeah, xenomorphs would be bad, 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 bad. They may look cool on screen, but I sure wouldn't want to run into one in a dark alley, that's for sure. Time on the HLT Trick or Treat Parade is 6.25 p.m. And speaking of life out there, let's have a close encounter of the third kind on HLT's Trick or Treat Parade. Darn it, kids. I'm so sorry. This has never happened in all the years we've done our annual trick-or-treat parade. But we're going to have to cut away again to another bulletin from Independent Network News. Independent Network News. This is a special report from Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt. Scientists from around the world are continuing to monitor the ongoing explosions of incandescent hydrogen gas occurring at regular intervals this evening on the surface of the planet Mars. In the last hour, Professor Emil Keller at the Johannesburg Observatory in Johannesburg, South Africa, is reporting that the explosions have started to grow in frequency from every 25 minutes or so to every 17 minutes or so and seem to be happening in groups of three explosions. The radiation from these as yet unexplained explosions are being directed toward Earth at a tremendous velocity, and while the explosions present no threat to Earth itself, the space radiation is expected to be great, and it is likely to play havoc with satellite-based television, telephone, and cell phone signals beginning in the next two hours and lasting for a period of 12 to 24 hours after the explosions cease. Scientists are at a loss to determine what is causing the explosions, nor have they been able to determine why they are happening so frequently and always in groups of three. This has been a special report from Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt. Independent Network News. (laughs) 
Okay, kids, anyone else out there that think maybe all this Mars stuff is more than a little weird? Ugh. How appropriate it's all happening on Halloween, though. I'm Jeff Bloom. Maybe we can actually keep music on for the trick-or-treaters out there for a few minutes. Here's Michael Jackson's classic thriller on HLT Community Radio's Trick-or-Treat Parade. The great Vincent Price closing out Michael Jackson Swiller on HLT's Trick or Treat Parade. Speaking of Vincent Price, despite all the many despicable characters he played in dozens of film over the years, and being best known for his work in the horror and thriller genres, he was actually known to be one of the good guys in Tinseltown, a sweet and kind man to both his fellow actors and his fans. Nothing like the crazy people he used to play on screen, you know, like the abominable Dr. Fives and such. In fact, several other horror icons were also nothing like most of the characters they played, like Boris Karloff and Peter Lorre. Fun trivia facts to liven up your Halloween here on HLT Community Radio. It's time to do a little dancing with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Let's all do the time warp on the Trick or Treat Parade. Astounding. Time is fleeting. Madness takes its toll. But listen closely... Not for very much longer. Eight. That's the time warp from the Rocky Horror Picture Show on the HLT Community Radio Trick or Treat Parade. And hey, kids, I'm sorry we have another interruption, but hey, at least they waited till the end of the song this time. We have another Mars update coming in from Independent Network News. Independent Network News. This is a special report from Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt. We are continuing to cover the ongoing story this evening about the unusual explosions of immense proportions that are occurring on the surface of the planet Mars. INN affiliate WBS in Boston has arranged a live interview with Professor Andrea Pitney of Boston's Blue Hill Observatory, who has been following this breaking story since it began several hours ago. We are letting our affiliates know that we will begin full-time coverage of this story at 7.40 p.m. Eastern Time, about four minutes from now. Stay tuned to this independent network news station for continuing coverage of the explosions on Mars. This has been a special report from Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt. Independent Network News. Kids, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to call it a night with the Trick or Treat Parade because of the ongoing Mars explosion story. But don't worry. We'll be back here again next year to do it again. Hopefully there won't be all these interruptions. I'm Jeff Bloom, and I hope everyone out there has a safe and prosperous Halloween tonight. And remember, kids, don't eat all that candy at once. Save some of it for tomorrow. This is HLT Community Radio, WHLT, AM and FM, 1510 AM, 103.1 FM, Holt Summit, Missouri. The time is 6.40 p.m., and we now join the full-time feed from the Independent Network News Service. Are we ready to go? Do we have any more information? Independent Network News. This is continuing coverage of the Mars explosions from Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt in New York. For those of you who may have just joined us, we have been following this story since early this afternoon when scientists and astronomers began reporting a series of unusual hydrogen gas explosions occurring at regular intervals today on the surface of the planet Mars. This kind of event is highly unusual, according to many scientists that observed the activity today. 
Dr. Richard Danielson of the Mount Jennings Observatory in Chicago, Illinois, was the first scientist to note the unusual explosions taking place and alerted other scientists and colleagues in the astronomy community, as well as alerting both the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and NASA of the activity. Observations throughout the afternoon have determined that the explosions are occurring at regular intervals, originally 25 or so minutes apart and now occurring approximately every 17 minutes, and also always in sets of three as observed by Professor Emil Keller of Johannesburg University's observatory. NASA issued what it called a blue alert about 45 minutes ago, calling on observers around the globe to report all their findings when it comes to these explosions. Although the explosions are tremendous and are likely to be causing enormous damage to the surface of Mars at the point they occur, they do not, repeat, do not pose a physical threat to Earth, but the explosions are sending waves of space radiation heading our way at a tremendous velocity. This radiation will pass through and around the Earth, causing temporary disruptions to satellite, telephone, and cell phone signals as they pass by. The first wave of said radiation is expected to arrive at approximately 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and disruptions could happen from that time until approximately 12 to 24 hours after the waves of explosions on Mars cease. To get a proper perspective on what's occurring and what it might mean, INN affiliate WBS Boston has reporter Tony Warden live at Blue Hill Observatory in Boston to speak with leading astronomer Professor Andrea Pitney. Tony, are you ready for the professor? Yes, Gary, we're ready. Good evening, everyone. This is Tony Warden of WBS Boston, and we are here at the Blue Hills Observatory, just outside Boston in Milton, Massachusetts. The observatory is known worldwide for its work in the astroscience. And right now, lead research astronomer Professor Andrea Pitney is up on the platform watching the unusual activity going on on Mars tonight. Let me start by saying that due to the ongoing events, Professor Pitney could be called away at any moment as she is presently in contact with dozens of scientific outposts around the world. Professor, are you ready? Yes, we can hear you fine, Professor. So, what are you observing right now? In the past hour, I have witnessed three series of explosions coming from the surface of Mars' southern hemisphere, with the third series having occurred just about two minutes ago. And can we continue to allay the public sphere and say that the explosions are not posing any danger to Earth? That's correct, Mr. Warden. The explosions are not large enough to reach all the way to Earth due to the vast distance. Mars is approximately 40 million miles from Earth. But the explosions are breaking the Martian atmosphere from their sheer power, and that is sending waves of space radiation toward Earth. However, they're not dangerous to people at all. They will pass right through the Earth, and no one will even realize it. But they could play havoc with satellites, the International Space Station, and any orbiting platforms like the Hubble Space Telescope. Professor, can you tell what's causing the explosions as yet? No. I'm afraid neither myself nor anyone in the scientific community is yet able to discern what is causing them. Has it been proven that there is no intelligent life on Mars? Well, certainly life as we know it doesn't exist there. Various NASA probes have found sources of ancient water, but that's it. Even microbes were not found in the soil samples analyzed by the Mars rover. I'd say the chances against any intelligent life on Mars are about 3 billion to 1. And yet both you and your colleagues have been observing regularly spaced explosions on the Martian surface, and they are known to be happening in groups of three. Is there any natural explanation for that? Unfortunately, I have none. This event is unlike anything I or any of my colleagues have ever seen. Could the explosions perhaps be an indicator that the planet is possibly preparing to destroy itself in some way? No, I don't think that's it. The usual signs for a dying planet or star are not in evidence in the explosions we are now seeing. Do you think that... Tony, it's Gary Hunt in New York. I apologize for cutting you off, but we've just received a bulletin from Independent News Services... They are reporting that a small earthquake has occurred approximately 20 to 25 miles north of Boston, somewhere near the Cape Ann region. 
This earthquake apparently taking place just about 10 minutes ago. Cape Ann was the source of the largest quake in New England's history, a 6.3 on the Richter scale. Back in 1755, it struck just days after two larger earthquakes struck Lisbon, Portugal on November 1st of that year. Tony, did you or the professor feel the tembler? No, Gary, we didn't. But just after you cut in with your bulletin, an assistant came to fetch Professor Pitney, and I followed her to just outside her office, where she's presently speaking to a Mass State police officer. I'm not sure why they are here consulting with her, but I'm sure... Yes, Trooper Galvin. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Professor Pitney, as you've been speaking to the trooper, we have been informed that there's been a small earthquake on the North Shore. Do you think there's any relation to the events presently happening on Mars? No, Mr. Warden. I think it has more to do with the meteorite that has come crashing down in some woods about seven miles east-northeast of Topsfield, on the outskirts of Bradley State Park. A meteorite, you say? Did the trooper tell you when it landed? Yes, about 15 minutes ago. It's a rather large one from the reports, and I'm on my way up to take a look at it. Would you like to come along? Definitely. We'll follow you. We are on a breaking story right now. A meteorite said to be of large proportions has landed near the town of Topsfield, and we're going to follow Professor Pitney up there to take a look. Okay, Tony, that sounds good. For those of you who have just joined our news program, Independent Network News has been bringing you an interview with Professor Andrea Pitney of Boston's Blue Hill Observatory about the ongoing explosions happening today on the surface of the planet Mars. We have, thanks to the professor, now stumbled onto another story that a large meteorite has fallen approximately 20 minutes ago somewhere in the vicinity of the Massachusetts towns of Topsfield and Essex. Professor Pitney is on her way to the site of the crash along with Tony Warden of INN affiliate WBS Boston and will bring us the story firsthand as soon as they arrive. INN time is 7.50 Eastern, 4.50 Pacific, we're going to cut away for a moment for a commercial and station identification of our local affiliates. We will be back in 90 seconds. I'm Gary Hunt in New York, and this is Independent Network News. WHLT AM FM Community Radio, 1510 AM, 103.1 FM, Holt Summit, Missouri. Independent Network News. It's the top of the hour, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, and you're listening to Independent Network News' continuing coverage of the explosions on the planet Mars. I'm Gary Hunt in New York. For those listeners who are just joining us at the top of the hour, INN is also following a breaking story in the state of Massachusetts. Tony Warden, with our affiliate WBS Boston, was interviewing noted astronomy professor Andrea Pitney at Boston's Blue Hill Observatory about the Mars explosions when she received word from the Mass State Police that a large meteorite had fallen approximately 30 minutes ago near the northern Massachusetts towns of Topsfield and Essex. Warden and his crew are following Professor Pitney to the crash site and we expect to have a follow-up report from them within the next 10 to 15 minutes. Professor Pitney has indicated that she does not believe that there is any correlation between this meteor strike in Massachusetts and the ongoing series of explosions on the planet Mars, which have been occurring at regular intervals for the past eight hours or so. Although these explosions are large, we are told by scientific authorities that they do not pose a direct threat to Earth at this time, Although the power of the explosions are pushing massive waves of space radiation toward the Earth at a tremendous velocity, this radiation is expected to pass harmlessly around and through the Earth without any danger to its population, but it is likely to cause some minor disruptions of satellite, telephone, and cell phone signals, as well as some minor effects on broadcast signals as they pass by, much like those that occur during severe sunspot activity. Scientists believe... 
I've just been handed a bulletin off the news wires. Satellite News Network is reporting that another small earthquake has been reported, this time detected by seismographs at the Seismology Unit of Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. This earthquake occurred approximately five minutes ago and appears to be centered about five miles east-northeast of the central Ohio town of Utica, 35 miles northeast of the capital city of Columbus. INN staffers are presently contacting our affiliate station, WQVD, in Mount Vernon, Ohio, to see if they can send a reporter to cover this event, as Mount Vernon is only 12 miles or so from where the earthquake occurred. INN will bring you more information on this event as it becomes available. We now have more information on the meteorite that has crashed to Earth this evening outside of Boston, Massachusetts. This report coming from the Central News Service out of Toronto. They are reporting that approximately 7.30 Eastern Time, a huge flaming object believed to be a meteorite fell on a farm outside the city of Topsfield, Massachusetts, 22 miles north of Boston. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Portsmouth, New Hampshire. One of the United States' leading authorities in astronomy, Professor Andrea Pittman, is en route to the crash site, accompanied by INN affiliate WBS Boston reporter Tony Warden, and we should be hearing from them shortly. This is Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt in New York. Independent Network News. This is continuing coverage of the events currently unfolding both on the planet Mars and here in the New England region of the United States. This is Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt. What started off as our coverage of the continuing series of unusual massive hydrogen explosions occurring at regular intervals on the surface of Mars has turned into even more of a story than we were initially covering. As a large meteorite has slammed into the Earth this evening, 22 miles north of Boston, just outside the town of Topsfield in northern Massachusetts. And we have, in just the past minute, received confirmation from the Ohio State Police that a second meteorite has slammed into the Earth approximately 38 miles northeast of Columbus, Ohio, near the central Ohio town of Utica. I'm being told that we now have Tony Warden and Professor Andrea Pitney of the Boston Blue Hill Observatory on the scene at the meteor strike in Massachusetts. Tony, can you hear me? Yes, Gary, I can hear you fine. Professor Pitney and myself made the journey from Milton to just outside Topsfield in just about a half hour. And to tell you the truth, I'm having a hard time putting my thoughts together to describe what we are seeing here that will give our listeners an idea of what is happening. We just arrived a couple of moments ago, and I have yet to have a chance to really check out the area or speak with the hordes of people now converging on the site. State police are here in force trying to control this growing crowd, and a huge number of reporters gathering for what they know is a huge story. About 60 yards in front of me is a large object. I have to say, it doesn't resemble any picture I've ever seen of meteors that have crashed to Earth from time to time. It's almost perfectly round, with a barely visible taper on the top end of it, and has almost a polished appearance. It is absolutely huge and is half buried in the gigantic pit. It obviously hit the ground with what must have been tons of force. There are trees splintered all around the area, likely crushed when the impact happened. Hold, hold on a moment. Professor Pitney? Yes, Mr. Warden? What would you say is the size of this object? 
from just the scientific eye, I'd estimate it to be about 40 yards in circumference. 40 yards? That's definitely huge. What about the appearance of the object, Professor? I have to admit, Mr. Warden, it does not appear to be a standard run-of-the-mill meteorite. Its polished appearance alone indicates that. It appears to be made of some kind of metal alloy, a kind of chrome color with flecks of blue and red in places. Gary, curious locals are continuing to press close to the object despite the best efforts of the Mass State Police to hold them back at what they consider a safe distance. The object is also radiating quite a bit of heat as well. Let me interrupt you for just a moment, Tony. Uh, we have confirmation of a second meteor crashing to Earth in central Ohio. A second meteor? What was that? Yes. And just a few seconds ago, I was handed a bulletin that said another small earthquake has occurred a few minutes ago, just north of Princeton, New Jersey, near the town of Grover's Mill. The discovery of the meteorite in Ohio was also preceded by reports of an earthquake in that area as well. Could you ask Professor Pitney for her insight on this? Professor, as you heard me mention a moment ago, INN in New York has confirmed a second meteor crash in central Ohio which was just after reports of a small earthquake, and INN is now receiving reports of yet another small earthquake along the same lines outside of Grower's Mill, New Jersey. What's your take on these events thus far? It's too soon to say. Normally, I'd say that the three were completely coincidental, but I have to admit, my scientific curiosity is at a very high level right now, Mr. Warden. And while the chances of such events being related in any way are probably, pardon the pun, astronomical, I have to admit that the closeness in timing and the similarity of the events that have been happening do suggest some sort of correlation somewhere. Thank you, Professor Andrea Pitney of the Boston Blue Hill Observatory. I'm sure we'll have more questions in a few moments. Whenever you have them, Mr. Warden. Let me address our listeners with my impressions for a moment, if I may. I wish I could express to you exactly what's happening here, but there are television cameras all around, and they should have video up shortly. But for those of you listening on WBS and on Independent Network News, the scene here is frantic. Hundreds of people are here, and more are arriving every minute. There are cars parked in the field behind me, on the road coming up to this area and the good men of the Mass State Police are having no luck containing the crowd. I can see someone arguing with the state trooper about wanting to touch the object. I'm sorry, I would not want to get into an argument with a state police officer, that's for sure. Something I haven't mentioned before with all the activity, but it's now becoming more distinct. Perhaps you can already hear it. Listen. Can you hear it? It's a distinct humming sound that seems to be coming from inside the object. It's very odd, not like anything I've ever heard before. Let me try to get closer so you can hear it better. Now I am only about 20 to 30 feet away. Can you hear it now? What an odd sound. Excuse me, Professor Pitney? Yes, Mr. Warden. Can you hear that noise? That odd scraping sound? It sounds like it's coming from inside the object. Any opinion of what might be making that noise? It could be the cooling of the surface of the object. It was incredibly hot as it plowed through our atmosphere and into the ground here. Any surface like that cools unevenly and is going to make various noises as it cools. Can I ask you to clarify what you think of the object now that you've seen it? Do you still believe it's a meteorite? Frankly, Mr. Warden, I don't know what to think. Whatever it's made up of, it's not the usual kind of metal found on most extraterrestrial objects. And yet, there's no doubt that it is such an object. There's certainly nothing like this found anywhere on Earth. And its smooth, cylindrical shape is completely out of the norm for such an object. Friction as it passes through the Earth's atmosphere should have torn holes in it, like nearly every other such object that has crashed into Earth. Hold on a moment. Something astonishing is happening. The end of the object is beginning to come off. Metal flakes are falling everywhere, and... And the top of the object seems to be opening up. Good God! Professor Pitney, could this thing be hollow? It appears to be hollow. 
Yes, it certainly appears that it is. To our listeners at WBS and Independent Network News, we are witnessing something incredible. This is both fascinating and terrifying all at once. I've never witnessed anything like this before. Just a moment. Good God, there's something beginning to emerge from the top of the cylinder. Someone or something is crawling out of the top of the opening in this object. Oh my God. Two large luminous discs have emerged. Good God, are those eyes? Could that be the face of whatever is inside this hollow object? Good God! Something is wrangling out of the hole like a giant gray snake of some kind. And there's a second one. And now a third one. My God, they look like tentacles. Tentacles like you'd find on the squid or an octopus. Almost the whole body of the creature has emerged. It's gigantic. It's almost serpent-like in appearance with giant appendages resembling tentacles. Its skin is shiny like a snake. Its face... It's horrible! I can barely stand to keep looking at it. The eyes are completely black, cold, vacant, but yet they gleam as though they are aware of everything around them. Its mouth is V-shaped and dripping with something. Is it saliva or possibly venom? The lips seem to quiver and pulse consecutively. They have no rim. The creature is turning slowly. It seems way down. Perhaps Earth's gravity is too strong for it. Just a minute. It's raising itself further up. The crowd around here is panicking now, fleeing toward the cars, littered all around the area. They are terrified, and who can blame them? We've got to get the higher vantage point. Dave, follow me. Professor Pitney, are you coming with us? Yes, right behind you. We need a moment to get into new position. New York, can you take it back, please? We'll be back in a moment or two. We need to get higher. This is Tony Warden, WBS Boston for Independent Network News outside Topfield, Massachusetts. Tony! Tony! Folks, this is turning out to be an extraordinary Halloween evening. I'm Gary Hunt, Independent Network News in New York. We are waiting to rejoin correspondent Tony Warden outside Thompsfield, Massachusetts, where what appeared a little while ago to be a meteorite strike that has apparently turned out to be some sort of space vehicle with a gigantic monster inside. We have just received another bulletin that Satellite News Network is reporting that in the last 10 minutes, six more of these large space objects, now apparently known to be something more than just a meteorite, apparently some sort of spaceship, have crashed into more areas throughout the eastern two-thirds of the United States and in Canada. We are receiving reports of one crashing near the Florida Everglades, one in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, about four miles from the Dollywood Amusement Park at Pigeon Forge. One has crashed on the outskirts of Thunder Bay, Ontario. Another one near the outskirts of Jefferson City, Missouri. A fifth one has crashed near Peoria, Illinois. And a sixth one has crashed into the downtown area of Wichita, Kansas, leveling most of that city's downtown area and completely cutting off Interstate 70 and U.S. Route 40 in the area. Officials in that area are saying that hundreds of people have been killed in that last crash. And... Hello? Am I on? Tony Warden in Massachusetts is back with us. Tony, go. This is Tony Warden, WBS Boston for Independent Network News, just outside Topsfield, Massachusetts. And things are continuing to get incredibly surreal here. If I wasn't seeing it with my own eyes, I would never believe it. We have relocated to just behind the stone wall about a quarter of a mile from the space vehicle that has crash landed here just over one hour ago. I will try to describe everything I am seeing to the best of my ability. More state police are arriving as every minute passes by. They have now cornered off the pit directly adjacent to the large round object that is apparently a spaceship of some sort, and the crowd of people have no problems staying back from the edge now. There are about 30 state troopers now standing between the object and the crowd, which is now more than willing to keep their distance. 
the trooper captain is conferring with someone. I can't tell... Oh yes, it's Professor Pitney. She broke away from us as we were relocating to see if she could help out down there. Now they are parting. They have apparently finished discussing whatever was they were discussing, and she is making her way around the side of the object now. She has something in her hand and appears to be trying to measure the size of the object, and now she's turned it higher up towards the creature. I think she's trying to determine its exact size. From our vantage point, it appears to be about 25 to 30 feet tall. Now the trooper captain is conferring with one or two others. One of those men appeared to be with the town of Topsfield. Okay. After they have conferred for a moment, the trooper captain has moved over with two more members of the Mass State Police. They appear to be doing something. What is it that they're doing? The captain has stepped forward with two of his troopers slightly behind him, and they are they have begun slowly moving forward towards the object. The captain is carrying a pole with a, what looks like like a white sheet or a pillowcase tied to it. The troopers are flying a flag of truce. Let's hope that this works. Does this creature know what that white flag means? Could they have any way of knowing what that means? What anything on earth means? Just a moment. Something appears to be happening. Something... A large shape of something is rising out of the pit. It looks like a large concave mirror. Wait a minute. There's a small beam of light shining onto the mirror. It's reddish green in color. A laser of some sort, perhaps. And now it's turning toward... Toward the approaching troopers. And good lord. There's a huge jet of flame shooting out from its mirror. And it's concentrated. Like a beam of fire. It's headed right towards the troopers. Oh my god, it hit them! It hit them! They are engulfed in flames! They are being incinerated! Oh no! The creature is turning the mirror and more flames are shooting out! Shooting everywhere! The entire field is on fire! It's hitting dozens of people in the crowd! It hits the dozens of cars parked here! The field! The nearby woods! You can hear the gas tanks and the cars exploding! The fire is spreading everywhere! Oh my god! Where's Professor Pitney? Can you see her? Oh my god! The mirror is in our direction! Oh my god! The fire is heading this way! 20 yards to our right! Oh god! Run! Run. Tony! Tony! Can you hear me? Tony Warden of WBS Boston, can you hear- Can someone find out what's going on? We have to get our facts straight here. Our remote from just outside Topsfield, Massachusetts has been cut off by something. We are doing our best to try and find out what happened out there. We are trying to reestablish our microwave relay link with WBS Boston's Tony Warden and hope to return to our coverage shortly. You're listening to Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt in New York. We have another bulletin for you. Independent Wire Services is reporting that while speaking at a fundraising dinner for the San Diego Astro Science Center, MIT professor Klaus Mannheim expressed his belief that the ongoing explosions on the surface of the planet Mars are, quote, most likely nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on Mars's known to be active chain of volcanic mountains, close quote. Mars does have the largest known active volcano in the solar system, named Olympus Mons by scientists, which stands two and a half times higher than Earth's biggest volcanic mountain, Mount Everest. We have just received a report by telephone from Topsfield, Massachusetts. Massachusetts State Police are saying that at least 85 people, including at least 10 state troopers, lie dead in a field northeast of the town of Topsfield, their bodies incinerated, mostly beyond recognition. Survivors have claimed that the creatures, are were there more than one? 
Survivors claim that the creatures retreated inside the pit they had emerged from and did not try to stop authorities or rescuers from helping survivors of this unusual, unprecedented situation. We are still trying to reestablish communication with WBS Boston correspondent Tony Warden at the scene of the attack. You're listening to Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt. Independent Network News. You're listening to the ongoing news coverage of the disaster now happening throughout the United States. This is Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt in New York. It's now 9.30 p.m. Eastern, 6.30 p.m. Pacific. Let me bring our listeners up to date on the ongoing crisis. The events began earlier today around 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time when Dr. Richard Danielson of the Mount Jennings Observatory in Chicago, Illinois, reported observing multiple explosions of incandescent gas occurring at rather regular intervals on the surface of the planet Mars. These explosions continued throughout the day, and at last check, they continue to be happening, although at a slower pace, they continue to explode in groups of three every 50 minutes or so. At approximately 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, what was believed to be a meteorite crashed to Earth outside the small town of Topsfield, Massachusetts, the first of 18 such meteorites that have now crashed into various parts of the United States, Canada, and Central and South America. Word reaching us just a few moments ago that three more of what we now know are not meteorites, but are actually some sort of space vehicle, have crashed in Belize, Brazil, and Argentina. Nine of these ships that have crashed into various areas have now been confirmed to have some sort of creatures within them and they will attack at the slightest provocation with a sort of fire ray gun as happened at the Topsfield, Massachusetts landing. INN was live on the air with INN affiliate WBS Boston's Tony Warden when the attack on that location occurred. Attacks have also happened from the vessels that crashed into the earth near the small central Ohio town of Utica, where 75 people have been reported killed, with nearly 100 others injured, and near Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, approximately four miles from the popular Dollywood Amusement Park, where authorities estimate casualties at around 25 to 30, with a few additional injuries. There have now been what we are going to call landings from this point on, in a total of 18 areas, and NASA has reported that they are recalibrating their space radar to hone in on any more of these vessels as they approach the Earth. At the request of the National Guard, Governor Baker of Massachusetts has enacted martial law throughout that state, and the Guard has also put adjoining states Rhode Island and New Hampshire on standby for possible activation of martial law there. Here is a rundown of the 18 areas affected by the landings. As noted a few moments ago, the first landing occurred just outside the small town of Topsfield, Massachusetts, followed by a second landing just outside of the small town of Utica, Ohio, and a third landing occurred near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. The second group included a landing in the Florida Everglades near Lake Okeechobee, another near Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, and one on the outskirts of Thunder Bay, Ontario. The third group included landings 16 miles west of Peoria, Illinois, just outside of Jefferson City, Missouri, near the small town of Holtz Summit, and in downtown Wichita, Kansas, much of which has been totally destroyed by the landing and its immediate impact. The fourth group included landings just outside Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, near Colorado Springs, Colorado, and on the outskirts of Austin, Texas. The fifth group of landings included near Montgomery, Alabama, another in farmland just outside of Spencer, Iowa, and a third in Lamanai in the Central American country of Belize. Finally, the most recent group of known landings includes the town of Salvador, Brazil, 
just outside of Cordoba, Argentina, and a third just north of Rachel, Nevada. We do not yet know the purpose of these landings or what the intent of the creatures inside are. Some authorities are calling these continuing landings an attempt at an invasion from somewhere in outer space, while others are preferring not to make that call just yet. And I've just been handed a bulletin. It is a brief message from the Massachusetts State Police. The charred remains of WBS correspondent Tony Warden and his sound man Dave Fletcher are among the bodies that have now been positively identified at a hospital in Beverly, Massachusetts. This is tragic news. Warden was providing INN with an ongoing first-person report of the activity in Massachusetts when struck down. Of course, our deepest condolences go out to the families of Warden and Fletcher and to all his colleagues at INN affiliate WBS Boston. We are also receiving word that INN affiliate WQVD Mount Vernon, Ohio has also lost uh, correspondents Sarah Gilman and Todd Pearson along with producer Steve Klein in the attack that occurred outside of Utica, Ohio. We also send our heartfelt condolences to their families and their WQVD colleagues as well. Independent Network News. This is Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt in New York. It's 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. The total number of alien vessels that have now landed in the guise of meteorites on Earth is now up to 24, with the most recent landing said to be outside Penticton, British Columbia, Napa, California, and Tijuana, Mexico. This story started this afternoon with reports of large, unexplained hydrogen gas explosions occurring at regular intervals on the surface of the planet Mars, and has continued to grow more sinister as the evening has gone on. The cylinders that have landed thus far contain large creatures believed to be in the number of three or four per vessel. Eyewitnesses have described the alien creatures to resemble large upright standing octopus with long gray tentacles, large glowing eyes, and brandishing at least one devastating weapon, some sort of fire gun that is concentrated by a large parabolic mirror. They stand between 15 and 20 feet tall and appear to have some difficulty moving, possibly due to Earth's gravity. There have been attacks by the alien creatures on civilians in several of the landing sites, including Topsfield, Massachusetts, Utica, Ohio, Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Cordoba, Argentina, with casualties now set somewhere near 600 total and growing. Meanwhile, the explosions are continued to occur on the surface of Mars, leading a group of government officials from around the world who have been conferencing by telephone that the explosions witnessed by dozens of scientists and astronomers since early this afternoon may be the result of the launch of the cylinder vessels now landing in groups of three on Earth, although there is no scientific confirmation at this time. And... I've just been handed another bulletin, this one from Grover's Mill, New Jersey. The New Jersey National Guard has engaged the aliens in the cylinder there after three of them emerged from their vessel. They were engaged by the aliens using both their fire weaponry as well as a second weapon, some kind of toxic smoke, against the militiamen. Between the two weapons, it is estimated that nearly 7,000 New Jersey Guard members lay dead in the field adjacent to where the cylinder landed. More militia are now on the ground following the aliens, who are now making their way north, now encased within giant three-legged vessels, the creatures inhabiting the dome area on the top of the vessels, and traversing great distances easily. 
They are destroying much in their path, including buildings, transportation lines, highways, high-tension electrical wires, and more as they continue on their way. And reports are indicating that they are headed in the direction of New York City. At the rate they are said to be moving, they are likely to reach the Jersey State Line within the hour. What? She is. I've just been informed that we have Professor Andrea Pitney from Boston's Blue Hill Observatory on the line. She has survived the attack on the area surrounding Topsfield, Massachusetts, and has set up a field operation unit at a small farm near the destruction. Professor Pitney, can you hear me? It's Gary Hunt in New York. Yes. Loud and clear for the moment, Mr. Hunt. Can you give us an insight as to what these creatures are and where they might actually come from? At this time, I have no scientific evidence to offer up a definitive answer to your question. But given the makeup of both their vessel and their weaponry, they are obviously intelligent and have purposely landed on Earth. This is not a random act. Can you give us an idea about their weapons, Professor? We are now hearing that the aliens in New Jersey have used some sort of toxic smoke against the militia there, resulting in thousands of casualties. Can you give us your insight on the fire weapon? The weapon used in the Topsfield Massacre is some sort of heat ray. It appears to use a laser-like beam to concentrate power and heat against a parabolic mirror through what looks like a glass lens, which shoots out a concentrated beam of superheated flame. There's no doubt that the people who were hit by it died within seconds. And it's obvious that these creatures, wherever they are from, have scientific knowledge far advanced of our own. As for the toxic smoke, I have not seen that yet. So your guess is as good as mine. We have reports that the Grover's Mill creatures are now in large, skeletal-like vessels and are heading for New York. Any such movement in your area, Professor? Yes. About five minutes ago, the creatures in the Topsfield vessel once again climbed out of their pit. They are operating what look to be large tripod walkers, not unlike those sometimes seen in our science fiction films. They are about 50 feet tall and have a bubble at the top where the creatures apparently operate the controls of the walking machine, for lack of a better term. Uh, which way do they go, Professor? Ours headed south towards Boston. Uh, we have another transmission coming in. Professor, can we stay in contact, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Professor Andrea Pitney from Boston's Blue Hill Observatory. I've just been told that we are turning over our airwaves to C-SPAN radio for a few moments. The Secretary of Defense is about to make a statement about the ongoing attack. We will be back on the other side of the announcement. This is C-SPAN radio. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary of Defense. My fellow Americans and citizens around the world, scientists have long insisted that there was no intelligent life as we know it in our galaxy's vicinity. And for years, we have been obsessed with that fact, trying to find other life forms that are somewhere out there. Today, we have discovered that we are not alone. We have discovered that life form it was at our own back door. It has come to us, and it is hostile. This unprovoked attack on our world has taken our planet completely off guard. Early reports indicate that military units across the country and in other countries have had some success with machine gun fire and large mortars, but not much else. Their weaponry is proving to be superior to what we have. We have no explanation for how their heat ray devices work, nor do we have an adequate defense against them at this time. We also do not know the makeup of a toxic smoke that was used in New Jersey, but it is fatal to everyone who is coming in contact with it. And even though we appear to be hopelessly outgunned by these creatures, we will not give up in the darkness of adversity. We will continue to battle to our best ability and hopefully find a weakness in the aliens and be able to protect all our citizens in the best manner possible. The President is in conference with more than 100 leaders from around the world as we strive to come up with a solution to help counter this outrageous and brutal attack. For now, while we are still trying to find what this invasion force wants, please try to stay calm, find shelter, 
go underground into a basement, cellar, or storm shelter if possible, and do your best to help your family, friends, and neighbors as well if you come under direct attack. We will bring you more news and information as it becomes available. Thank you. God bless all of you, and God bless the planet Earth. This is C-SPAN Radio. That was a message from the United States Secretary of Defense. He has indicated that they are overwhelmed by this sudden attack, that they are operating on the assumption that the attack is coming from invaders from the planet Mars, and that they are working hard to find a defensive strategy against the attacks now occurring. We have been informed during that message from the Secretary of Defense that communications throughout the United States, Canada, Central and South America are beginning to break down due to landlines and cables being destroyed by the alien creatures. Cell phone usage is spotty throughout most of the Western Hemisphere due to the radiation passing around our planet at this time, playing havoc with their signals. We have reports that the large octopus-like aliens have now emerged in their large tripod walkers from several more landing positions and are headed for large populated cities nearest their landing locations. Four more of the locations are now reporting the use of both the heat ray and toxic smoke on the local opposition and the populations in their immediate area. Toxic smoke attacks are now occurring in Alabama, Ohio, Nevada, Texas, Mexico, and Brazil, with more likely to start happening in the near future. Reports from across the country tonight indicate that in the areas affected by the landings, the highways are clogged with people trying to get away from these enormous creatures that are closing in on those areas, making escape nearly impossible. This is Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt. Independent Network News. This is ongoing coverage of the Martian invasion of Earth. You're listening to Independent Network News. I'm Gary Hunt in New York. It's 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific. I have moved from our main studio to the balcony of our broadcast headquarters in Manhattan, where I have a clear view of New Jersey on the other side of the river. The sights and sounds are eerie, and below me, on the streets of New York, I can see the streets are clogged with people trying to evacuate the city. The Martians are only a few miles away, walking toward the city in their massive tripod machines, shooting their heat ray, and releasing toxic smoke throughout the Garden State as they make their way in this direction. The bells at cathedrals around the city continue to ring, warning people to evacuate the city. In the last two hours, officials estimate that nearly two million people have made their way out of the city and onto roads heading upstate, although it's hard to say if that will be any protection in the long run. Avoid trying to evacuate to Long Island. The bridges are hopelessly clogged. Communications with New Jersey ceased about 20 minutes ago. Boston is also under siege at this hour, as are a number of other cities throughout the Western Hemisphere. And as we reached the top of the hour, we were receiving word of the first landings in Hawaii, Guam, Japan, the Philippines, Taiwan, and on the Russian and Chinese mainland. More landers are probably coming too. The explosions on Mars were still happening as of 10.30 Eastern Time this evening. There is now no doubt We have looked away for a long, long time, and we were wrong. There was intelligent life out there, and it was right under our noses. It is only human vanity that we chose to ignore the signs out there. 
and they are obviously stronger than we are. All of the New Jersey defenses have been wiped out. As I stand here, I know that I'm not likely to see my wife and children ever again. But I'm a newsman. It is my job to make sure the people stay informed. Paula, Gary Jr., and Nicole know I love them and always will. I can see the harbor from here as well. All manners of boats overloaded with fleeing population pulling out from the docks. The streets below are all jammed. I've been handed another bulletin. Eighteen more landings have been reported throughout the whole of Europe and Asia and one on the Australian continent as well. One of the vessels also took down the International Space Station as it came in. More brave souls, those just doing their duty because they love it, killed without reason. But another note coming directly to me from Professor Andrea Pitney of Boston's Blue Hill Observatory. She tells me that her colleagues around the world are reporting that the explosions on Mars ceased approximately 90 minutes ago. So that means they've stopped launching vehicles, I would assume, and... Gary, come back in. No, I'm going to stay. Get everyone downstairs as soon as you can. Go, go. Sorry about that, folks. Trying to get our staffers to some sort of safety. And... Wait a moment. Yes, I can see the tripods. They're in sight now. Just above the Palisades. They are... There are... Five. Five of them. Two more must have come out of the Grover's Mill vessel that weren't reported. I can see the bubble-like top on each of them. They are moving quickly. The first one is stepping into the Hudson now. He's wading through it like a farm boy on his local creek. It's growing taller. There must be more expansion in the legs of the tripod. It has no hesitation. It has a purpose. To reach this shore. Which it does, now climbing out of the water. It is standing there, just watching. It seems curious. Perhaps the sound of the bells are throwing it off. Perhaps they don't have the chime of bells where it comes from. Its bubble head top is parallel with many of the skyscrapers in New York skyline. Its head is turning back now. It's waiting for the others which have started to cross the river. They're climbing out of the river, one by one, looking like gigantic new towers on the west side. They are looking at each other. They appear to be calculating. They know exactly what they're doing. Now they're lifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke, drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running toward the East River. Thousands of them, dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue. 5th Avenue. <coughs> 100 yards away. 50, <coughs> 50 feet.
The next voice you will hear is that of Professor Andrea Pitney. That first wave of Martians was hell. Seeing hundreds of people incinerated before your eyes, including people you know, is not something you will ever forget. The first 24 hours was the worst, as more landers kept slamming into the earth, allowing their tentacled occupants to come out and ravage the countrysides of the world. Nothing the Earth's military did could stop them. Landers in all parts of the world, ravaging the human population with their insidious, instantly deadly heat rays and their toxic smoke choking the life out of so many humans and animals. Millions upon millions of people died all over this wondrous blue world. But it wasn't over for humanity. Things began to change on the fifth day, when the creatures, having ravaged most of the cities around the world, started coming down from their tripod shells and stepped out into the world to claim what they had conquered. And that became their downfall. By day 11, it was all over. Less than two weeks after their arrival, all of the Martians, with their mighty weaponry and foreboding, terrifying appearances, were dead. Their corpses quickly decomposing where they fell. But it wasn't mankind that took them down. It was Mother Earth herself. She looked at these invaders, told herself she wasn't having this, and unleashed her greatest weapon against them. After all the armies of the world tried and failed to defeat the Martians, they were defeated by their own inner weakness, their own bodies. They weren't prepared for the one thing that mankind has not yet been able to bring to its knees for its own population as yet, and the Martians had no defense at all. They fell victim to the one thing that their might and weaponry had no way to fight. They fell victim to the common cold. Their bodies had no immunity to Earth's vast array of microbes and viruses. After one was infected, all the others were exposed, and in less than two weeks, they were all dead. One hopes they told their homeworld what was happening to them, for it should keep them from ever trying this again. But now that we know we have enemies on our closest planetary neighbor, we will remain ever vigilant. And as mankind picks up the pieces and begins to rebuild, humanity will do what it does best in crises like this. Survive. PNR Premier Audio Productions dramatic adaptation of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells was written and produced by T.C. Kirkham in tribute to the 80th anniversary of the 1938 broadcast of the story by the Mercury Theater of the Air starring Orson Welles and the 1968 broadcast of the story by WKBW AM Buffalo, New York. Our players were in alphabetical order Kim Brown, T.C. Kirkham, Anthony Lamberti, Courtney Lyon, Eric Lyon, Valerie Lyon, and Matthew McCallum. Representing the PNR Network of Podcasts, Ant B's Comic Grotto, Catastrophe Vortex, Cave Babble, Front Row 5 and 10, The Kirkham Report, Platinum Roses Garden, Ring Around the Rosy, Subject Cinema, Tuesday Digidex and 3 Minute Weekend. PNR Network's websites eCinema1.com, eCinemaBoston.com, SubjectCinema.com, PlatinumRosesGarden.com, RingAroundTheRosie.net, TheKirkhamReport.com, CaveBabble.com, and ComicGrotto.com. All PNR Network's productions and websites are a labor of love. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to our various sites on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And please help us spread the word. Also, PNR Networks does not accept advertising and depends on our readers and listeners for support. 
If you liked this special presentation and all our other sites and shows, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. You can find all the details at patreon.com backslash PNR Networks. For PNR Premier Audio Productions and PNR Networks, I'm T.C. Kirkham. We wish everyone a safe and pleasant Halloween. Podcasting's choice from coast to coast, continent to continent, right here, 24-7. P-A-R-A.